But I'd now like to uh, uh, introduce uh, our uh, speaker uh, this afternoon and to uh, welcome uh, Paul Harris back to the uh, FCC. Uh, Paul, uh, as I'm sure you know, is a distinguished lawyer. He's a senior counsel. Uh, for many years, he's been a, a prominent figure in Hong Kong's courts. Uh, he's been involved with uh, high-profile high human rights cases, uh, never one to shy away from a sensitive issue. Uh, he's represented Falun Gong protesters, among others. Next week, he will be rep representing a Pakistani uh, client in Hong Kong's first judicial review concerning human trafficking. <clears throat> Paul has become one of the world's leading experts on peaceful protest. Uh, that will be the subject of his talk today. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who were here before the handover will remember uh, that uh, whether peaceful protest would continue uh, was uh, one of the concerns which was aired. Since the handover, we know uh, protests have very much been part of uh, Hong Kong life. Uh, we can think uh, particularly of July the 1st, 2003, half a million people on the streets, and more recently, uh, the Occupy Central protests. <clears throat> but where did the idea of peaceful protest come from? How has it developed? Why is it that some protests succeed and others fail? What about civil disobedience? <clears throat> is that permissible? When is it permissible? These are questions that uh, Paul has tackled um, in his recently published book, Raising Freedom's Banner, How Peaceful Demonstrations Have Changed the World. Okay. <clears throat> and Paul will be around uh, at the end of his talk to right. sign copies of his book, which will be on sale. So I very much look forward to Paul's talk. <clears throat> Please give a warm welcome to Paul Harris. Thank you very much, Cliff. Uh, Hong Kong has really given me a lot, and one thing that it's given me mm -hmm. is uh, intense interest in uh, demonstrations, because Hong Kong has a remarkably highly developed uh, demonstration culture. I got interested in the subject because I represented Falun Gong demonstrators in a, who'd been arrested for obstructing the pavement. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the case went all the way to the Court of Final Appeal, um, because I said that uh, if there was to be any protection of the right to demonstrate, which there is in Hong Kong's basic law, then this had to mean that some uh, obstruction, reasonable obstruction, was permitted, and my client's obstruction was reasonable. It was a big area of pavement outside the central government um, uh, liaison office in Western, and the real reason why they'd been dragged away was the words on their banner, which said, Jiang Zemin, stop the killing. And uh, event, uh, after a very unpleasant and long trial in the magistrate's court, where all of my 16 clients were convicted on every charge, we eventually uh, got to the court of final appeal and all of them were acquitted. And uh, because of that, I got thinking about why does Hong Kong have in its basic law, Article 27, Hong Kong residents shall have the right of demonstration? What does this right mean? Where does the idea come from? And this set me on a very strange path of research, uh, which e eventually led to my book. Um, what I'm going to try and do um, uh, this afternoon I, is just mention a few of the main things that I discovered, and I very much hope that that will encourage people to um, delve into it a bit more by reading my book. Uh, when I started, there seemed to be no book at all that told me where the idea came from. And I went up a lot of blind alleys because I thought, when did they start? Did the, did the Greeks or the Romans have them? And after I'd read quite a few books, the answer was no, they didn't. And what about medieval Europe? No, nothing. Um, where was the first recorded peaceful demonstration? Uh, riots, angry crowds, they've been there since the beginning of human beings. 
but the idea of deliberately going out and saying, we are peaceful, but we wish to make our point um, with a march and some banners. Well, the first recorded instance was in 1126 in China, in Beijing. Uh, and the northern Song dynasty was about to fall. The uh, Jurchens, a nomadic people from, North, from Manchuria, were mm. about to seize the city. Uh, the emperor was about to surrender, and the students from the Imperial College uh, came out in, into the street with banners, uh, calling on him not to do so and to appoint a prime minister who was a, uh, someone who wanted to fight the Jurchens. They were led by a man called Chen Tung, and the prime minister they wanted was appointed. Their demonstration succeeded to that extent, although the Jurchens did I eventually take Beijing, and that was the end of the Northern Song Dynasty. So this was actually another Chinese first, although um, the idea didn't continue uh, into modern times in China. The, the idea of the students as a kind of tribune of the people carried on through the dynasties up until the Qing dynasty, the Manchu dynasty. Uh, when the students did this to the Kangxi emperor, he executed all of them. And after that, the tradition w was dead, although it's still known about by quite a few people in China. Um, so that w those were the first ones. But the demonstrations we have in the streets here and around the world, they originate from 18th century England, where um, people wanted to have parliamentary reform, and they wanted to show that they were people of peace and respectable people who deserved the vote. So not like those violent, dangerous French revolutionaries in Paris um, uh, who were guillotining people at the time of the first English demonstration in 1795. And uh, all all the modern demonstrations anywhere in the world can really be traced to that one meeting of a body called the London Corresponding Society in Islington in a big open space in 1795 when they told people, you are not to bring weapons, we are peaceful reformers, um, this is a peaceful meeting um, to pass a resolution calling for universal suffrage. And this was really a novelty in the world, because until then, uh, in England, political protest was done by political riots. England was not a despotism like France, Prussia, Spain, Russia, most European countries. It had a parliament. You could exert pressure on the parliament. Um, by making your views known. And in the eight, most of the 18th century, this was done by rioting. It was the great century of political riots that John Wilkes is the most famous name associated with them. Most interesting man, very colourful character, but he was both a, a rioter in the sense that his supporters were called, uh, were, when they gathered, it, it was described as the Wilkite riots, but he was a rule of law man. When he was freed by his supporters as he was about to be taken to prison for supposed contempt of court, and they put him into a carriage to parade him round London, he said, take me to the King's Bench prison. I need to obey the law and serve my sentence. And that's what happened. And this... Um, tradition of adherence to the rule of law was a big feature of the early English demonstrators. It carried through into the early 19th century when Henry Hunt was the big uh, campaigner for parliamentary reform, Orator Hunt. Hunt was the speaker at the famous Peterloo meeting in Manchester where the soldiers were called out and massacred peaceful people um, listening to Hunt speaking, um, I was I inspired to put a lot of effort into this book when I went to a meeting in London about protest where I heard a representative from a group called Plain Stupid, who don't like aeroplanes, um, 
saying that he believed in direct action and that he thought it was silly to say that demonstrators should obey the law. Um, and did people know that uh, the famous meeting at Peterloo in 1819 had been an illegal meeting? And this was simply untrue. And so I, uh, I felt the extra impetus to write the book. Though Hunt and his associates were so concerned about legality that they got an opinion from a barrister in Liverpool about were their arrangements for the meeting legal. The barrister said no. They postponed the meeting and completely rearranged it in order to comply with the law. And um, this, um, this type of legal protest reached a great climax in 1832 when it actually made the United Kingdom a democracy. Uh, this was at the time of the, the first reform bill, and reform was, was being blocked main, mainly by the House of Lords. Um, a group called the Birmingham Political Union started organizing massive meetings in Birmingham, England's second city with no member of parliament. Secretly, the reforming Prime Minister Earl Grey contacted the leader of the Birmingham Union and said, I like your, uh, dem your demonstrations. Uh, you should have a few more of them. It would be most helpful. And uh, this happened. Um, and the climax of, of all this was um, Grey resigned. The Duke of Wellington, arch-conservative, took over. He was probably planning a massacre and a kind of military crackdown. It didn't happen because in every town in England, people stopped work, came out on the streets and demonstrated, and businesses closed, um, people stopped working. Uh, it was called the Days of May, and after a few days, Wellington gave up, and the Reform Bill became the Reform Act, and the Parliament was uh, vastly more democratic than before. This success was established demonstrations as, as a good way of doing things. And they then spread around the world because they spread from England to Australia. And in Australia, they were used to get an eight-hour working day, which had never happened anywhere before in the world. And then Australia became known as the workers' paradise. This was around 1856. And, uh, and then workers, representatives all around the world started um, organizing demonstrations. One of the early ones it involved a May Day parade in Chicago. And that was very well attended. And it then had tr a tragic aftermath when um, uh, police decided to break up um, a meeting um, by speakers who were broadly anarchist. And as they were breaking it up, someone threw a bomb at the police. Um, panic ensued in Chicago. And the speakers at the meeting were all put on trial, accused of having murdered the policemen because the contents of their speeches, in which they said things like capitalism should be overthrown, were encouraging people like the bomb thrower. And therefore, they were responsible. And uh, they were convicted, and uh, four of them were hanged. And this caused such outrage around the world that workers' groups in many, many countries said, we're going to make May Day the workers' day. And from 1890 onwards, all around the world, workers had a demonstration on May Day. So that was basically how it spread. It spread much quicker into some places than others. And why is a very strange and interesting issue, which um, uh, I do go into in the book. It spread very fast in Russia, although Russia is an autocratic place. But um, for some reason, it, the Russians seemed to like it, and it caught on very quickly. It was very slow coming in France, because the French uh, had had several revolutions, and they'd all started from the streets. And French Democrats didn't want any more revolutions. In 1880, France passed a law saying all meetings on the public highway without permission are illegal. And this was enforced. And May Day demonstrations were broken up. But there was no demonstration of the kind we would recognize in Paris until 1911, although the first one in London was 1795. And they never got going in Germany. 
Um, people, Germans tried to copy the English reformers in 1832 and were thrown into prison. Uh, and uh, in Germany, if you went out onto the street to do something political, you were a, you were a fighter. And, and um, in Weimar Germany, all the political parties had bands of military people who went out and fought battles in the street um, with other bands, and that and one of those bands was the Nazi party and um, possibly if they'd had peaceful demonstrations they might not have got going. So um, that was the history of the sort of um, what I would call the law-abiding demonstration. Then came Gandhi and he was something quite different. He was deliberate peaceful law-breaking. He wasn't the first person to think of the idea but he was the first person to apply it on a really big scale. And of course, he was very successful. Um, and what I, the issue of when it's justified to break the law has never gone away. And obviously, there was Occupy Central in Hong Kong last year, and that was deliberate uh, law breaking. Clearly, actually, blocking a highway is illegal. And um, I try in my book to go into the issues of moral justification. Gandhi was immensely influential. Uh, he had uh, people who tried to follow him in South Africa, Robert Sabukwe. That failed with the tragedy of Sharpeville. Uh, he was uh, followed very consciously and directly by Martin Luther King uh, in the American Civil Rights Movement. But Martin Luther King was a rule of law man. He held marches to break state laws which he believed were in breach themselves of the American Constitution. And um, his argument was, I'm not breaking the law because these laws are illegal. And he was eventually felt found to be correct by the American Supreme Court. Uh, Edwards in South Carolina and Shuttleworth in the city of Birmingham, the two uh, famous cases. And it, Gandhi also very heavily influenced Greenpeace in their direct action. Um, now, this is, there's scope for endless argument, but my personal view is that um, Gandhi was entirely justified as his country was being ruled by a foreign power. Um, in a democracy, my view is that there are only two situations where um, breaking the law deliberately is justifiable. One is where the law is utterly absurd and breaking it does no harm. A good example in my book was the law Tony Blair passed, banning all demonstrations within uh, half a mile of Parliament while Parliament was sitting. This, uh, le this included the Cenotaph in Whitehall, and a woman called Maya Evans went to the Cenotaph and held a one-woman demonstration reading out the names of soldiers who'd been killed in Iraq. She was actually prosecuted, but that resulted in uh, Gordon Brown the, uh, saying the law would be repealed. That was an absurd, wrong law, and her breaking of it did no harm to anybody. It just um, focused on the absurdity. The other situation is a situation of great extremity. Now, this is my personal view. It is controversial. I felt that the, I had no part whatsoever in the Occupy Central movement. I wasn't actually in Hong Kong while it was happening. But I felt that um, given that Hong Kong was being absolutely denied meaningful democracy um, uh, and uh, its freedoms uh, under continuing threat, I felt that there was not much alternative uh, to uh, what was attempted by Occupy Central. I was very thankful they ended it without um, carrying on to the point where there would have been a violent end. But I, I felt it was a sufficiently extreme situation to justify that kind of extreme um, type of demonstration. Generally, I feel that so-called direct action, law-breaking demonstrations are anti-democratic. And um, I think if the leader of Plain Stupid was faced with another group called Plain Lovely, who wanted more aeroplanes, who wanted to demonstrate in exactly the same place at the same time, so that a brawl ensued, I think he might modify his views. Um, it's a 
precious hard-won right, and it will very rapidly be lost if people don't realize that resorting to, um, uh, to force um, will then bring in people who love resorting to force and will create um, a, a sort of uncontrollable violent situation. So I'm rather conservative in that way. Um, I'm a very, I believe peaceful demonstrations are a tremendous force for good. They give a voice to the voiceless. You don't need much equipment to go out there and, and make your point. And it may be a point that no one will ever notice if you um, don't do that. You may not be a very articulate person who can write a letter to the newspaper or um, do anything else to bring it to your attention. Um, People often think, oh, these demonstrators causing trouble, making me late for work by blocking the road. But they need to remember that the demonstrations have replaced riots, just like cars have replaced horse and, horses and carts. They're a much more um, effective and trouble-free way for people to express their views. Um, so that is the essence of what the book is about. Um, I also look at demonstrations and the law, although the book is really a popular history book. Um, the law always lags behind uh, public opinion, and the law has not been good about protecting demonstrations. And in fact, uh, the human rights conventions have been enormously helpful because they have set out very clearly that um, there is a right to demonstrate. In most countries, this is described as freedom of assembly. Hong Kong's rather unusual in actually referring to a, a right of demonstration. Uh, before that, both English law and American law were very poor. Demonstrations were ever so common in England, but no legal protection at all, and they were often just banned on uh, very flimsy grounds. And in America, where the word freedom of assembly gained currency, originally it didn't mean meetings and demonstrations at all. It referred to the meeting um, of the uh, state legislature. And it uh, became important because it was the Massachusetts state legislature that was organizing the revolt of the American colonists. And in the early stages, the British general uh, in Massachusetts declared that it would be treason for the Massachusetts State Assembly to meet. And that was why, when the American Constitution was drawn up, it said um, the right of the people um, to peace peaceably assemble shall not be abridged. And for 150 years or so, that was what it meant. And there was no protection in America for marches or meetings. And that didn't come for meetings until 1939, and for marches until the civil rights movement and the cases I mentioned earlier. So um, it, it, it's a very sort of strange and um, unpredictable history um, that led to its recognition. Um, th but it is now recognized, and for the reasons that um, I've outlined, um, I believe it is a very valuable right. It's a fragile right. I have another chapter on demonstrations and the police because the things the police get up to to interfere with demonstrations in every country, as far as I can see, uh, are rather startling and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and shocking. Um, the um, police almost invariably use infiltrators who don't just infiltrate criminal organizations, but infiltrate entirely law-abiding organizations. And there's, once they're in, and I've got a lot of personal experience of this from chairing the Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor, although I have to say I've got no evidence the Hong Kong police infiltrated, but uh, mainland security uh, agents certainly did. Um, it, there's been a lot of publicity about it in England. Some people may have heard the name of Mark Kennedy, who was an undercover policeman. Um, the um, Vietnam War protests in the United States, um, they were very heavily infiltrated. Um, there was a trial, the Gaines for Gainesville 8, that collapsed when it became clear there were infiltrators. And this happened uh, with the very first demonstrations like um, the the parliamentary reformers in England, some of them were put on trial and the trials collapsed when it 
became clear that alleged um, proposals for violence had originated from infiltrators who, who were actually home office spies. So, so it's there all the time. And the way it works is that the infiltrator has an enormous incentive to talk up th supposed threats from the group because it justifies his salary and um, therefore he also has an incentive well, he, he also needs to keep his disguise, so he has an incentive to appear very militant. And so in, in all the countries I've mentioned, you have this pattern of the super militant member of the protest group who opposes reasonable compromises and always wants to be more militant, who turns out to be a police agent provocateur. And when you're thinking about whether to keep your demonstration law-abiding or whether to have a bit of direct action, a demonstration organizer has to bear in mind that he may have a police agent provocateur in his group. And there are instances of um, people throwing stones on the fringes of a peaceful demonstration, supposed demonstrators, and then being stopped by peaceful co-demonstrators, and then walking through police lines showing a badge. That's, that happened in London a few years ago. I describe it in the book. So um, that's, that is, uh, is one thing. The other thing is the um, really horrifying number of, um, of massacres and, um, and brutal breakings up of demonstrations. And my book's dedicated to all the people who've been killed while peacefully demonstrating, and, and I list about... 25 places where that happened on a big scale. Um, and I hope that if more people read my book, more people will realize that peaceful demonstrations are a good thing and that they should be protected. So um, I think that really uh, sums it up. I'll stop there and I'll do my best to answer questions. OK, I'm, I'm a member of the FCC here, Holton. And what is the best strategy in dealing with the infiltrators? Well, I can tell you what I did when I chaired Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor. We, it was not difficult to identify at least one of them, and uh, there, were, there was more than one, and, and I met with my close colleagues, and we decided we will just leave them in place because we have nothing to hide. Um, we are exactly who we say we are, a uh, human rights monitoring group, and um, let's keep them there. We know who they are. If we, um, if we expel them, we may get a more subtle operator who we don't identify, and, um, and we just carry on. Um, that, of course, we were not a demonstrating group. Um, that if you are demonstrating and you're worried about agent provocateurs, well, um, you need to organize your demonstration very carefully. I have a chapter on what makes for a successful demonstration. And one of the first things is good organization. Most big demonstrations have stewards who usually wear armbands. And part of their job is to immediately notice if there's someone in a peaceful demonstration who's actually being violent and make sure that they, they're taken away if necessary in co cooperation with the police saying this person isn't following our rules and, and he's being violent and we don't want him here. Um, in that is, um, that's directly getting rid of them. Having a good, tight, organized program for the march with a starting point and a finishing point and, and, and a program also makes it much less likely that, um, uh, that an agent provocateur can, can do damage. And indeed, the case I mentioned in London the provocateurs were trying to do damage, but the peaceful demonstrators, who clearly understood what they were doing, spotted them, immediately involved the police, and, and defused the attempt. I think the, the other thing is, if you have, this is an advice I'd give to any organizer of any kind of action, based on my experience over my lifetime, if in your group you have a person who appears mindlessly militant, um, just consider the possibility that they might be an agent, agent provocateur, um, because that is very much the characteristic. 
Um, if they're very young, perhaps not. They're just over-enthusiastic. But someone older than that, be on your guard. That, that's my, my best advice. Article 27. It's amazing why nobody seemed to be either aware how this is in the basic law. All this, what gives everyone the right here to you to get up and talk and for us to demonstrate and uh, scream and yell and shout about C.Y. Lung's daughter less, latest escapade, it, because it's all in the basic law in Article 27, which reads identically, like almost identically, with the American First Amendment, which is kind of interesting because the First Amendment uh, well, it doesn't mention labor unions because, well, Jefferson and Washington didn't need labor unions because they owned all those slaves. 2,500 slaves were owned by the, all the signers of the uh, Declaration of Independence, promising life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, except for the slaves that they owned. So, uh, meanwhile, we got um, uh, Article 27, the right to strike, which they didn't have, of course, as I said before. Uh, and for, when the First Amendment was written, and uh, they both read very similar, with very tight, 65, 70 words. In America, there are think tanks, there are university departments, there are all, ACLU, for example, focusing nothing but on one thing, the First Amendment. But nobody pays any attention here in Hong Kong about Hong Kong's First Amendment, which is Article 27. How to correct that? Well, um, You've touched on something really interesting, because, which I had, I've just got time to mention. Why is that right to demonstrate there in Article 27? I was absolutely amazed when I worked out what had happened, because it doesn't come from the British side, it comes from the Chinese side. Um, the basic law was drafted by the, the basic law drafting committee. It was a half British, half uh, Chinese committee. Freedom of assembly, obviously, is an American in its origin. And that's also there. The, the base, um, through Article 39, which brings in the Hong Kong Bill of Rights, which has freedom of assembly. So, but the right of demonstration, why is that there? Well, if you look around the whole world, you only find half a dozen countries which have the right to demonstrate in their constitution. The first one was the 1918 Bolshevik constitution of, the, of, of uh, Soviet Russia. Lenin was a great fan of demonstrations. I don't like Lenin. Demonstrations are still good, even though he was one of their fans. Um, but he was very astute in realizing how they could help the Bolsheviks come to power. And the first, therefore, the first Bolshevik constitution said um, that people shall have full facilities to hold demonstrations, including provision of newsprint and paper for banners. And um, of course, it didn't happen. The first big attempt at a demonstration after the Bolsheviks took power was the Kronstadt uprising, as it's sometimes called, which was crushed by the army. And after that, there were no demonstrations in the Soviet Union until the 1960s. Um, but the second Soviet constitution in that took it out, but the third one put it back in. That was the Stalin constitution of 1936. That was a piece of propaganda. It bore no relationship to life in the Soviet Union. It was designed to make Western sympathizers of communism think that the Soviet Union had an even better constitution than the American constitution. But it did say the people shall have the right of demonstration and it was copied in the Chinese Communist Constitution, and it is still there in the Constitution of China today. And that is why um, it, was a, it makes sense for the Chinese side to have proposed it to go into Hong Kong's basic law. So thanks to um, uh, Stalin's attempt at lying propaganda, um, the right to demonstrate has actually become a real right in Hong Kong today. Um, I really was pretty surprised when I discovered that. Um, and uh, so that's where it comes from. I think there's room for vastly more study uh, on this subject. It was a very difficult book to research because it was such a wide area. And, uh, you know, I've done my best, but there's a lot more waiting to be discovered. Um, if, uh, perhaps um, just one little thing. But, the word demonstration, 
where did that come from? Um, it came from England in 1839. There were dem demonstrations were happening before, but they were just called marches or meetings. And 80, if there's a, a research, uh, there's an old newspaper called the Annual Register, uh, which recorded events every year in England from right through the 19th century. You go through it year by year. You don't see the word demonstration until 1839. Then you see it, and then you see it many times every year. I won't, in, in the hope that a few people might actually read my book, I won't tell you how it came about in 1839. I'll leave that for people who want to actually look at the book. But it is quite a, a strange and surprising story as well. What do you say to some cynical people who said that when the British heck were colonial rulers of Hong Kong, they gave Hong Kong people the right to demonstrate because they didn't want to give Hong Kong people democracy. So it's just a way to give Hong Kong people a vent to let off steam, you know? My second question is, in Southeast Asia, there are so many poor people, um, uh, masterminds can bribe all these poor people to launch demonstrations to depose a political leader. Um, what are your comments on that? Right, right. Um, the, on, on the first one, um, you've got to get the chronology right. Um, there was no uh, right to demonstrate in Hong Kong until the Bill of Rights came. That was um, shortly after the Tiananmen Square massacre. The motivation uh, was to reassure Hong Kong people that they would have some rights after the handover in 1997. Um, so, uh, so I don't think it was a cynical attempt to allow people to let off steam instead of having democracy. What's the British, sorry to interrupt, what was the British legal stance on all these pro-communist demonstrations in Hong Kong in the 60s? Um, well, they, in the 60s, there was a state of emergency. And if you look at um, the right to freedom of assembly in the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, and in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Hong Kong Bill of Rights, um, there is um, power to, um, to restrict it on grounds of public order. Um, and there's also more general power in relation to situations of, um, of emergency. Um, but I mean, so I mean, that's what happened there. And I mean, all sorts of things happened in the 60s that couldn't be justified. Otherwise, uh, um, I mean, pe people detained for long periods in administrative prison without trial. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone could point to that as being, a, you know, a normal state of society. Um, your second point, I have a whole chapter in the book called Demonstrations and Revolution. Um, it's a very difficult subject, and the Philippines is a very interesting example of the sort of um, strengths and weaknesses. Um, it's an extreme high-stakes game to try and bring down a regime by demonstrations. <clears throat> it worked against the, the Tsarist Russians, uh, Russian regime in 1917. And it worked against President Marcos of the Philippines in 1985, but it, it, it only worked because powerful factions within the ruling elite supported the demonstrators. And I think that's probably a general rule, that unless you've got that kind of support, trying to bring down a regime just by peaceful demonstrations is not going to work. It's far more likely to result um, in a massacre. There is also, I think, um, a problem, and you, I think you've put your finger on it in Thailand and in the Philippines, with what are really anti-democratic um, demonstrating movements trying to bring down a democratically elected government. Um, and I, I, I think that is um, very retrograde. I think that weakens democracy and it's, it's illegitimate. Um, the, the, uh, the, the demonstrators in Bangkok, um, they could point to all sorts of things uh, wrong with um, Taksin Shinawatra's government, but Taksin Shinawatra was the elected, prime, the elected prime minister. Similarly, the demonstrations against Joseph Estrada in the Philippines, Estrada were, was not impressive, but he was democratically elected. He may even have had majority support at the time when he, was, he actually resigned. And I, so I think 
those are very negative developments, and uh, and uh, they actually damage democracy. So that, that's my my answer to that. Okay, time for one more question. Hello, um, I work for the European Endowment for Democracy, based in Brussels, actually. Where would you draw the line in terms of um, actors, foreign actors, supporting demonstrations in other countries? Um, we, for example, received requests for support in Ukra from Ukraine, asking for support um, for tents, etc. Um, and we clearly said, no, this is not something that um, a foreign organization <laughs> should be involved in. However, we do support media that report on demonstrations. We support lawyers in Armenia that um, support activists who have been arrested. So where would you say the line should be drawn between um, supporting people who come to you, of course, for, for, um, for help in terms of foundations, donors, that um, work in human rights and democracy support? First of all, to, um, you'd have to look very carefully at what sort of uh, gr group was doing the organizing. Secondly, I would think that foreign support is often quite counterproductive um, because uh, it, it tends to discredit demonstrators if the government can say, oh, they're being supported by this foreign country that wants to undermine our country. Um, so I know that's not very helpful given that you're in the business of actually providing that support. But I, I think um, there, it is much better to do what you say you're doing, which is indirect support. Making sure a demonstration gets coverage is very important because ever since peaceful demonstrations started, the authorities have tried to suppress information about them. Going right back again to Peterloo in 1819, there was, the Times correspondent was there to cover Henry Hunt's meeting. Uh, he was the only journalist there. And when the, the soldiers uh, broke up the meeting, uh, they arrested the Times correspondent and kept him in custody. And this was a deliberate attempt to prevent what happened in Manchester being reported. And uh, it was in fact reported by a man on the spot who sent long reports to the Times, and that man, radicalized by what happened, uh, went on to found the Manchester Guardian. Um, so uh, that was a, an interesting byproduct. Paris, 18, 1961, I'm sorry, yes. um, there was an absolutely horrific massacre of Algerian demonstrators by the police. Um, hundreds killed. Um, all French news organizations were banned from reporting it. And news about it only trickled out very gradually over the years. Um, in recent years, there's been some, there was some talk of putting on trial the French interior minister at the time. I think he died before that could happen. Um, but that was a really uh, startling instance of how in relatively modern times in a sophisticated country like France, in the capital city. Something like that could happen, and French people simply didn't know about it. Um, and so I think that by supporting media coverage of demonstrations, you're probably doing something very valuable. Uh, <coughs> fascinating speech. Uh, we talk about peaceful demonstrations so much in, in Hong Kong, but not so much about uh, uh, the history uh, behind them. Um, <coughs> So very valuable to uh, hear your thoughts today, Paul, and, and great to, uh, to see you back in Hong Kong. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget that uh, Paul will be around to sign copies of, uh, of his book for those who are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you.